Hey guys, today we are taking the HP Elite 8200 small form factor PC and we will upgrade pretty much all aspects. I sold out quite a bit recently, but now we can compare the GT 1030, GDX 1050 and GDX 1050 Ti on this machine. We will also upgrade the processor to an i7-2600, take the RAM all the way to 32GB and install an SSD. I also have power draw results to answer the question if the built-in power supply is up to the task. The idea is to show you how far we can take this machine, but I will also give you my thoughts on what I feel is the best value option, meaning getting the most performance gain for your money. Because in the end, we all have a budget and can't just get the very best parts. My HP Elite 8200 came with a Core i5-2400, 4GB of RAM and a 250GB hard disk drive. The very first thing I recommend upgrading is hands down installing a dedicated graphics card. Even with just 4GB of RAM, this will make the largest difference and is the first thing I would change. Here we have an overview of all the video cards we're using with all these specifications. We've got a Gigabyte GD1030, a Yesten GDX 1050 and a colorful GDX 1050 Ti. Okay, let's dive straight into the results for 3D Mark. We've got three lines here. The orange one is the 1030, the yellow one is the 1050 and the green one is the GDX 1050 Ti. And now we're looking at some games. The first game is Crisis. At the top you can see the release here and at the bottom you can see all the details and this axis is 40 frames per second. And what we can see is that at the low details there's really no difference. We are CPU limited. Same goes for medium. But once we go to high and very high the uh, 1050 cards can separate themselves. However between the 1050 and the TI there's not much of a difference. Next up we've got Dirt 3 from 2011. This is a very well optimized game. Even on the 1030 with 2x MSAA we're getting 63 FPS and it's only at that very high graphics settings that the GDX 1050 Ti can kind of separate itself from the non-Ti. And the next game is Tomb Raider from 2013. We can see the 1050 results pretty close to each other and we can also see that both cards manage more than 60 FPS even at ultra details. Here we have Bioshock Infinite from 2013 and once again the 1050 cards are very close to each other with the TI uh, being in front and once again these two cards can deliver above 60 FPS even at ultra. The 1030 is still hanging in there but once you go above medium, we don't get 60 FPS anymore. And here we have Rise of the Tomb Raider from 2015. We can now see a nice separation between the 1050 and the 1050 Ti, but both cards at very high struggle with the performance. They're not reaching 60 FPS. However, if you have the 1050 Ti and you play with high details, you're very close at the 60 FPS mark. Dirt Rally is a new addition to my benchmarks. It is from 2015 and still quite optimized. But look at that, the 1050 and the 1050 Ti, there's basically no difference. Only at very high do we get a small difference. And the final game is Deus Ex Mankind Divided. This is the most GPU bound game and we can see it here clearly with the 1050 and the 1050 Ti uh, separating itself nicely. But all the cards struggle with this game and none of the cards are able to deliver more than 60 FPS in this game even at low details. But really this is more an issue with the game not being very optimized. Not so much with what these video cards can do. So which graphics card should you go for? Well, a lot has to do with pricing and this will change greatly on your region. So I'll just share my thoughts on Australian prices. That way you can apply that thinking to your region. Here we have buy it now prices on eBay. These are in stock, no sales or discounts in Australian dollars, including shipping. And these are all the low profile versions. So you can get the 1030 for $106, the GDX 1050 for 165, and the 1050 Ti for 230 Australian dollars. So the fastest and best option is the GDX 1050 Ti, but at 230 Australian dollars, it's also the most expensive one. If you are on a budget, you can't go wrong with the GT 1030. At only 106 Australian dollars, this card is affordable, has all the latest technology like HDMI 2.0 and FastSync support. It is single slot and consumes only 30 watts of power. In terms of which card is the best value, meaning getting the most FPS for your money, go with the GDX 1050. 
at 165 Australian dollars. It's a lot cheaper than the TI, but it isn't that much slower. But there's one important aspect to consider, and that is the amount of VRAM. The GD1030 and the GDX1050 come with 2 GB, whereas only the GDX1050 Ti has 4 GB. This will let you select higher details on the GDX1050 Ti without running out of memory. Now a lot of this depends on the game, but you might find that with a detail setting that requires 4 GB of VRAM, the 1050 cards are a little bit on the slow side and you would lower the details anyway. But regardless, these are my thoughts. Go with the 1030 on a budget, get the GDX 1050 for best value, and if you want the best and can afford it, get the GDX 1050 Ti. Next up we're gonna upgrade the processor. The machine came with the i5-2400 and we upgraded it to the i7-2600. Here we have the 3 d Mark results. We can see that especially the older benchmarks benefit greatly from the faster processor, but the new Firestrike not so much. In Crisis we can also see an improvement in performance, especially with low and medium details. We see a similar result in Dirt 3, especially at ultra low and low there's an improvement with the i7, but once you crank up the details, the performance difference narrows. In Tomb Raider we can see a difference only with low details, once we crank up the visuals, there is no difference. The same goes for Bioshock Infinite, only at very low can we see a performance difference. Once we go with the higher detail settings, both processors perform identical. Rise of the Tomb Raider is another game with not much of a difference. In fact, at the lowest detail setting, the i5-2400 actually benchmarked a little bit faster. Dirt Rally shows the same picture. In the low detail settings, the i7 is a little bit in front, but as we crank up the details, the performance difference narrows. And finally, Deus Ex, Mankind Divided, heavily GPU bound, no difference between these two processors. So should you upgrade to the i7-2600? Most games showed little difference between the i5 and the i7. The largest differences could be seen in Crisis, Dirt 3 and Dirt Rally. Considering that an i7-2600 is not a processor that you can get easily for a super low price, I believe for gaming it's not worth it and you should just stick with the i5-2400. Especially at the higher detail settings, you will mostly be limited by the graphics card. But what about non-gaming tasks? Here we've got results for CPU Z, the i5 scores 1264, whereas the i7 improves to 1731. Next up we've got Cinebench R15, the score improves from 434 to 618. We also have some Blender results, less is more, so the i5 scores 283, whereas the i7 gets 200. And we have some video transcoding results, less is more, these are in seconds, so the i5 takes 76 seconds, whereas the i7 completes the task in 56 seconds. So in tasks outside of gaming, especially anything that benefits from having lots of threads, the i7-2600 is clearly faster. So if you're doing any video editing, rendering, transcoding, 3D rendering, or anything else that is heavily threaded, then upgrading to the i7-2600 might be worth it. What about the power supply? Can the built-in power supply even handle all of these upgrades? Here we have some power draw results. Orange is sitting idle on the desktop, yellow is CPU set the stress test, and then the green bar is MSI combustor, including the CPU burner. So looking at these numbers, the first thing we can see is that this machine is quite tuned for efficiency and low power consumption. Less than 30 watts when idle is quite impressive. Loading the GPU and CPU gives us a worst case power consumption of 135 watts with the i7 and 124 watts with the i5. In actual games, you will get much lower numbers, especially if you have a V-Sync enabled. The power supply in the HP Elite 8200 is rated at up to 240 watts. It's a high quality power supply and it is also very efficient. All in all, I can comfortably say that the power supply is not a concern at all. It will quite comfortably power a fully upgraded machine. But what about RAM? Here we have the machine upgraded to its maximum capacity of 32 gigabytes. But this is just to show you that it's possible. My machine came with 4 gigabytes, and while all the games ran, I did experience very long loading times, especially with all the modern titles, as well as skips and pauses during the game. I highly recommend upgrading the RAM to at least 8GB. 
If you can afford 16 gigabyte, that's even better, but you will only see minor improvements. 32 gigabyte, I find to be overkill for gaming, but if you're running some demanding productivity software, then it's good to know that this machine can handle 32 gig. This might be an option for later when memory prices aren't as inflated as they are now. And now let's talk about storage. The 250GB SATA hard disk drive the machine came with isn't very fast. A solid state drive is the way to go, but prices have gone up lately. I would recommend a 120GB storage for Windows, your applications, Steam and a few games that you're currently playing. Add a hard drive for storing photos, video files, games that you aren't playing too often and you got the best of both worlds. Fast speed of the SSD and lots of storage space on the HDD. In Australia at least, a 4TB hard drive seems to be the sweet spot in terms of how much storage you can get for your money. Now that was a lot of information, let's try to summarize everything. What would I recommend? If you're on a budget, I would get the GT1030 and an extra 4GB of RAM and leave everything as it is. If you have a bit more to spend and you want the best value, I would get the GDX 1050, an extra 4 or 8 gigabyte of RAM, as well as a 120 gigabyte SSD. And if you want to get the most out of the machine and you got the money to spend, go with the GDX 1050 Ti, upgrade to the i7 2600, go with 32 gigabytes of RAM and install a 240 gig SSD, as well as a 4 terabyte hard drive. And that's the HP Elite 8200 with a few upgrade options. This video took me quite some time to put together, but it was also fun seeing the results visually unfold and hopefully you will find this useful. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, click on that bell icon to get notifications and let me know what you think down below in the comment section. Thanks for watching and I shall see you soon with another one.